As far as landings go, it seems that there is nothing more basic than your standard, normal approach in landing. Even the name suggests that this is a bland procedure of routine and mundane performance. Despite this guise, however, the normal landing is by far the most complex, nuanced, and difficult procedure to master as an aspiring pilot in training. Rudimentary skills can make a normal approach in landing survivable, but true mastery makes them enjoyable for both pilots and passengers. Skillful application and performance of advanced landing techniques such as short and soft field landing operations hinges upon the perfected execution of the normal approach in landing. A normal situation leading to the normal approach in landing will include things like having engine power available, light or no wind, the final approach in landing planned into the wind, and no obstacles in the approach path. With this in mind, the normal approach and landing should be adequate for most general aviation aircraft at airports with runways nearing 3,000 feet in length and greater. This distance could be shorter at low density altitudes. The final decision rests with the pilot in command and the capabilities of the aircraft. The technique for accomplishing a normal landing is similar for many aircraft. However, there are slight differences for achieving the proper performance and technique between makes and models. Always reference the appropriate aircraft flight manual or pilot's operating handbook for guidance in your aircraft and consult an experienced certified flight instructor. This Aerocast episode will focus on the techniques outlined in the UND Aerospace standardized procedures specifically in the Cessna 172 from traffic pattern all the way through rollout. The objective of this standardization lesson is to develop the pilot's proficiency on normal approaches and landings. The success of the landing is determined by the success and establishment of a good approach. This means, simply, a great landing starts with a great pattern. It is important to review then some specifics for the basic traffic pattern and the stabilized approach. The traffic pattern itself will be based upon a selected aiming point. During a normal landing, the aiming point should be chosen according to available references, not on a predetermined touchdown point. For a normal landing, prioritize by first using the visual glide slope indicators, meaning the PAPI or the VASI. Then use the aiming point markings, the 1,000 foot markers. And finally, a pilot selected point if these other indicators or markings are not available for that runway. If the pilot must select a point, ensure that using this point positions the landing at least 200 feet beyond the threshold and within the first third of the runway. The touchdown point will generally be 150 to 200 feet beyond the aiming point. However, the exact distance will vary with winds, aircraft performance, and pilot technique. If in doubt of being able to accomplish the landing in the available runway using these aiming points, then the pilot should choose a different type of landing or possibly a more suitable runway. The downwind leg should be positioned approximately three quarters of a mile from the runway. Using references on the aircraft can assist in estimating this distance. Looking at the strut on the Cessna 172, the runway should intersect the strut at a point two-thirds from the fuselage towards the wing. For those flying light, low-wing GA aircraft, using two-thirds up the wing from the fuselage also works in most cases. This can be handy at night and at airports that have runways not aligned with other recognizable geographic references such as roads and section lines. In the Cessna 172, fly downwind trimmed at 90 knots. As the aircraft approaches the abeam point, begin a slow reduction of power to transition to 80 knots and apply necessary trim. Once abeam the aiming point, reduce power further and extend flaps to 10 degrees. Let the aircraft descend as it decelerates through 80 knots. As the pilot turns base, apply 20 degrees of flaps and the aircraft should slow through 70 knots. Position the base leg approximately three quarters of a mile from the aiming point and don't forget to apply correction for any crosswind experienced. This is also a good point to gauge how things are looking using both the aiming point and any visual glide path indicators that may be available.
They should indicate the aircraft is slightly high while traversing the base leg. The aircraft should still be smoothly decelerating and descending as the pilot turns final and applies full flaps. Indicated airspeed should now be at 61 knots within an envelope of plus 5 knots and minus 0 and the aircraft should be trimmed accordingly. If done correctly, these steps will place you on glide path at approximately 250 feet AGL. If the pilot is not established at the proper indicated airspeed of 61 knots, plus 5, minus 0, on the proper glide path or aligned with the extended runway centerline by 200 feet AGL, an immediate go-around must be executed. During the final approach, the aiming point will be the most useful and critical element for maintaining a stable and consistent flight path. The pilot should locate this on the runway, a beam to any visual glide path indicators for additional guidance during the approach. The standardization manual requires this if visual flight path indicators are present. Remember, these indicators are a reference to enable the pilot to better use the chosen aiming point with the proper approach path and develop the necessary sight picture when landing the aircraft. The touchdown point will be a predictable point beyond this aiming point, generally around 150 to 200 feet depending upon wind conditions. When the aircraft is in position after a well-executed traffic pattern, the final approach will be a balance of control and power applications. The pilot must control the aircraft to maintain the position of the aiming point in the windscreen. When flown correctly, this point will not move and the general appearance of the runway will remain unchanged, only growing in the windscreen. Properly trimming the aircraft at this point will make flying this approach infinitely easier. It is important to realize that the aircraft is on the back side of the power curve. Any increase in pitch will increase drag and reduce speed significantly. Pitch control will have to be balanced with smooth power control. Pitch will affect airspeed the most and power will change the flight path. With experience, making these adjustments to smoothly maintain the desired flight path and aiming point will become an almost subconscious skill. Developing this skill is key when determining if an approach is stabilized. If at any time the success of the landing or approach is in serious doubt, use power and execute a go-around. The standardization manual will guide the pilot to begin the round out at approximately 10 to 20 feet above the runway surface. This position equates well to where ground effect begins to have a noticeable impact on performance. The pilot may notice the aircraft begin to float slightly or the aiming point begin to move down in the windscreen despite no significant changes in control input. All of these sensations are signals to begin the round out by smoothly reducing power to idle with slight increases in back pressure to balance the nose down pitching moment accompanying this power reduction. As the pilot increases back pressure, it will be important to transition the reference from the aiming point to the horizon to gauge the effectiveness of the round out. The pilot is striving to smoothly arrest the descent and increase angle of attack so that the stall warning horn sounds as the wheels touch down. At no point should the pilot release back pressure or apply forward pressure in an attempt to force the aircraft to touch down. Once the main wheels do touch down, back pressure must continue to be maintained as the aircraft slows so that the nose gear will be smoothly lowered onto the runway surface.